Let's get into the word. We're in the book of Jonah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. The word of God says, beginning with verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, which is modern day Spain. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. I wanna preach today from the title, When We Get It Wrong. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the opportunity to know you better. As we delve into a new series, Father, we want you to challenge us, especially today, as this foundational springboard for the series. May our hearts be convicted. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen and amen. That's a lot of money to spend just to get away from the Lord. I mean, a vacation to Spain? <laughs> I mean, you got to set up hotel arrangements. You probably don't know anybody there, but that's a lot to invest to get away from the Lord. When I first read this story and heard this story as a, as a young person, I, I never quite understood why he wanted to run away from God. Now, later on in the book, we are going to discover exactly why, but all we know at this point is clearly the prophet Jonah does not want to have anything to do with God's instructions. Now, growing up, um, we were often uh, alerted to what happens to Jonah because in the very next verse, in verse 4, something goes down. And and when you decide to run away from God, verse 4 has always been used to kind of scare us back into submission. Now read it. Verse 4 says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. You can run, but you cannot hide. This is what we were told. You can run, but you cannot hide. When God has his mark on you, when God has instructions for you, you don't get a say. You better do as he asks. In fact, when I was determining what series I would go into next, I was speaking with uh, some of the leaders in our church, and I was toggling between doing a series on the Sabbath, which we will eventually do, and Jonah. And one of our leaders says, oh, I like Jonah because jo Jonah's my story. Jonah's my story, this leader said, and, 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 and I know why people connect with this story because many of us can relate to running from our purpose, running from God, running from our destiny, running from what God has laid out before us clearly of what our lives should be, and eventually he catches up to us. But I do want to say from a theological standpoint, because this book is deeply theological, is that we can run from God. We've been running from God from jump, right? According to scripture, Satan and one third of heaven decided to bounce. They decided to walk out. They decided to run. And God respects that, right? He could have kept them in the courts of heaven. He could, have, he, could have, he could have fenced them in and said, I love you too much to let you go. But God does not do that. He allows them to first disagree and allows them to walk. Look at Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve have sinned, what goes down? They hear God walking in the cool of the day, and then the Bible says they ran because they were afraid. This happens all throughout scripture where people make a different decision than God and don't get it twisted, he respects it. You remember the time when God talks to Moses and says, hey, Mo, I want you to do me a solid. I want you to go before Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. What was Moses' first response? No, <laughs> not doing it. 
God has to try to convince him with some, you know, almost like some parlor tricks. Hey, I want you to put your hand in your vest, remove it. It's leprous, put it back. It's now healed. Throw your staff on the ground. It turns into a snake, grab by its tail, and now it's a staff again. I'm not impressed. I'm not going. Moses tries to explain to God, I'm not good with speaking. I'm going to fumble with my speech. I don't remember the Egyptian language. I have a speech impediment. And God is like, who made your mouth? And Moses basically says, you ain't convincing me. I'm not going. Send my brother Aaron. He's much better. He, he went to seminary. So what does God say? All right, your big bro's on his way. In this particular circumstance, God accepts his no for an answer. I don't want to speak in front of Pharaoh, I'm not going to do it. And God says, okay. This happened even in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family were dragged out. His two daughters were dragged out of the city. And the angels tell them, go run to the mountains so that you can flee from the destruction. They said, no. They're like, "Uh, we just saved you. (laughs) And you're going to tell us no? No, we want to go to the nearby town over here. We know some people and they got a Walmart open 24-7. Let's just, we want to go there. God's like, okay. I think this is important for us to know because if God does not accept our no, then God does not allow us to have choice. Right? If God cannot accept our no, it would mean that he will not accept our choice. So you need to understand in this story, God accepts Jonah's no. But then we're looking at verse 4 and it says, but God sent a storm. So it sounds like he didn't like his answer. Well, let's keep reading. The Bible tells us that the storm is so fierce that the sailors are afraid for their lives. And the, the, the captain says, I want everybody to pray to their gods so we can get out of this mess. And, 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 and Jonah is fast asleep in the bottom of the boat. Now, let me tell you something. When you are up to no good, and you know you're up to no good, that should cause you to have a difficult time sleeping. No? Anybody? You have a rough time sleeping when you know you ain't up to no good? Your conscience is kind of like tormenting you a little bit? You're having dreams and nightmares? You wake up with bags under your eyes? You've been wrestling with God all night long in your dreams? My man Jonah says no, books himself a cruise to Spain, and gets into his cabin, and falls into a deep sleep. He ain't got no problems. He ain't got no problems saying no to God. He ain't got no problems living life the way he has chosen to live them. But the captain wakes him up and says, how can you sleep during a time like this? Bro, we're all about to die. We need you to pray to your God. Now, do you think Jonah wants to pray to God right now? He running from him, right? (laughs) I mean... His whole Expedia account has been set up to escape God. He, there's no way he, need, he wants to talk with God right now. We need you to pray. Jonah ain't praying. So finally, the men decide they need to find out who the culprit is because the storm is not ceasing. So they begin to cast lots, and the lots fall on Jonah. So now they know Jonah is the cause of this storm. So they rush up to him. They said, what did you do, man? What did you do? Verse 9, he answered them, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. So that was a rhetorical question, right? Man, what in the world did you do? You don't run away from God. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? This is what they're asking Jonah. You know your God. You understand uh, what you've learned in Sabbath school. You know how he operates. So you just tell us what we ought to do and we'll do it. Jonah's response is nowhere found in the Torah. No Sabbath school lesson has ever taught him this. It is not in the minister's manual. He tells them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And it will calm down. 
I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Question, where did he get this? Why would he think for a second this is the way to get out of the mess? If I'm Jonah, I would simply say, hey, um, can you take me to Nineveh? <laughs> if you believe the storm is for you, and it's because you are running from God and not following his instructions, wouldn't the right move be, then let me turn it around. Jonah gets to the point where he would rather die than do what God has asked. Y'all heard me? He would rather die than do what God has asked. See, this is really what most of us struggle with. Most of you, if I were to, to, to uh, uh, take a survey, would be very, very, very clear about knowing what God wants for your life and what he doesn't want for your life. Many of you right now are in situationships. Many of you are in certain circumstances where you know you ought not to be, but you've chosen to be there because it's what feels good right now, right? Most of us know this. You don't even need a sermon. You don't even need a sermon to tell you you shouldn't be uh, caught up in that kind of mess. But you're willing to still stay in it, and most of you are willing to do so even at the risk of your life, even at the risk of your own health. And what makes matters worse, even at the risk of everyone else around you, their safety, their well-being. The problem is, is that when we move outside of God's will, not only do we harm ourselves, but we often harm others. Our decision simply to say, I'm no longer in love with you, can impact our children, and not just impact our children, but impact our grandchildren and generations to come. When God says that, 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 the, that, the, that he would visit judgment upon the iniquity up into the fourth generation, he wasn't saying, I'm going to punish them for what you did. He's simply saying that sin's catastrophic consequences will impact you all the way up until the fourth generation. There are many of us who are where we are today because of generational sins. Decisions that our great-grandparents made that didn't think it was ever going to reach me or reach my son, they do. We learn how to handle stress. We learn how to handle relationship problems, watching our parents, watching our aunts and uncles, watching our grandparents. We learn how to handle anger. We learn how to handle finances, watching our caregivers. We learn how to understand God, watching their behavior, watching how they deal with us, justly or unjustly. When we work outside of God's will, when we do not follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we will impact not only our current circumstances, but the situation and circumstances of our children and their children. I'm saying this to you because you need to understand the weight of Jonah's decision is heavy. And he notices, he notices this, he understands this, and he would rather die than do the right thing. That's deep. <laughs> that is deep. And I've met some people like that. I know some of you have met people like that. Know they're in the wrong, and their pride will not allow them to admit it. What do you do when things go wrong? Many of us, our pride will not allow us to repent. And that word repent simply means to turn back, to turn away, to to change the way in which we are thinking. When we think about even the fall in heaven, right? God allowing Lucifer and one third to go. Lucifer's failure wasn't a lack of knowledge. He knew. He wasn't enticed with more money. He wasn't enticed with, with, uh, with a higher paying job. What tripped up Lucifer is pride. Meaning he was convicted, knew he was wrong, knew it was heading to nowhere, and he would rather be thrown overboard than admit that he was wrong. I hate to say this is the issue in households of people that believe in Jesus Christ. So much pride you cannot admit that you're wrong. You can't admit it to your children. You can't admit it to your spouse. You can't admit it to your parents. 
and we hold on to this pride. We cherish this pride. Jonah would rather die. He would rather commit suicide than own up to his decision. Now, of course, looking at this, it looks like God is trying to get at him, right? God is maybe a little bit petty. God lost his temper. God's feelings were hurt. But I just want to say something to you. When you decide to go out on the sea, sometimes they're just storms, right? Not every storm God sent. You know that, right? Not every situation you're in, God sent. You know this, right? Just because you got a flat tire didn't mean that God popped it. You just ran over a nail. And I, I want you to understand this because Jonah's going to say something a little bit later that lets us understand that his worldview and his view of God is a little bit twisted. The men in the boat do their best to not have to resort to throwing Jonah overboard. It says instead the men did their best to row back to land. They wanted to row back to land. Where they needed to row to is Nineveh. <laughs> But they just tried to row back to land. See, 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 when we find out that we're in mess, we've been caught, meaning that the Spirit has convicted us, told us that we're, that we're in a place in no man's land, right, where we need to, uh, to, 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 to get back on track with God. It, it's interesting. Some of us just want to get to dry land. We just want a, an anchor somewhere else. I don't want to do what God is doing, but I will do this. We'll try to find a compromise. I'll go half the way. I'll go just a little bit of the way. I'll just get off the sea. You don't want me to be in this situation ship? I'll just get off the sea. Don't worry. But God's like, I don't just want you to get out of the situation ship. I want you to do as I asked. Men did their best, it says, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. I'm telling you right now, what do you do when you get it wrong? What do you do when you get it wrong? You go back to where God is standing. You go back to the place where God is moving. You go back to the lane in which he's in. You go back to his original instructions. I talked to someone this week, recently got married, and they called me about two weeks after the wedding said, I need to talk to you, it's really important. I said, oh boy, what happened? Wasn't that much time, I'm thinking, okay, maybe something happened during the honeymoon, uh, you know, so I'm starting to panic a little bit, reaching out to them, hey, I'm available, we can talk, and then I'm not hearing back. I said, hey, I'm starting to get a little nervous, starting to get a little nervous. When they finally told me what was going on, and, and nothing involving infidelity, look at you guys all being nosy, But they tell me what's going on, and it was a serious situation, and, and, and this person could not reveal it to their spouse. They made a decision that their spouse should have been involved in, but they chose not to do it because they were fearful. They were afraid of what their spouse would in, uh, encourage them to do. They did it alone. It was a very difficult thing to hear about. I said, oh, I'm so sorry you went alone at this. I'm so sorry you were by yourself making this decision. And as this person was sharing with me, uh, you know, their feelings and the guilt and the shame and the weight of their decision, I wanted to remind them of one thing. I said, I just want you to know, this decision does not have to color the rest of your life. This decision doesn't need to be the foundation in which you build on moving forward. When we are caught up in sin, sometimes all you need to simply do is this, turn away. Turn away. Don't let it define you. Don't let it be your new mantra. Don't let it be the new top 40 hit in your life. Just simply turn away. That's all repentance means. Turn away. I said, I know you're in a tough situation right now, and your guilt is getting the best of you, but know this, God does not guilt us, and God does not shame us. Guilt and shame never comes from God. The only thing that comes from God is conviction. That's it. Not guilt, not shame. So he simply, so, so I'm talking to this person, I'm saying, from this point on, live the way you ought to live. That's it. From this point on, you're not making these type of decisions anymore. From this point on, it's a new start. And that's what God gives us. 
And this is the opportunity that Jonah has. Except Jonah says, uh, just kill me. Try to make it to shore. If that doesn't work for sure, just kill me. Then the sailors cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing the innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Verse 15 says, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew what? Calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, some are going to tell me, see, pastor, this clearly lets you know this was God's plan all along. That clearly the storm was sent in order to capture Jonah so he could do what God had asked him to do from the beginning. And clearly this was his plan all along. I just want you to know, Jonah made God look bad. Can I be honest? Jonah makes God look very bad. He's basically saying this to the sailors. My God is the type of God that when you run from him and disobey him, the only thing that is going to satiate him, the only thing that's going to calm him down is bloodshed. So kill me and my God will stop being angry. Is that true? Is that true? We know that's not true. That, that God is not demanding the blood of, of any offender. Not even in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve made the decision that they made that God said, all right now, both of you, your head's on the chopping block. We're getting this over with. No, in fact, he says this, I'm going to give you a seed. I'm sending my son. He will crush the head of the serpent. It is God who bleeds for us. He makes God look as bad as Poseidon. That's the Greek God of the sea, who often was credited for destroying ships and killing sailors. He makes God look like that. Jonah says, I worship the God who created the heavens and the earth. They're like, whoa, whoa, a God who's both land and sea? He, he created everything. He's the God of the land. He's the God of the sea. He's the God of the heavens. That's who I worship. You mean your God does it all. He is it. He's just one God. We have thousands of gods. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. My God is so great. He's done it all. He's created it all, and I'm running from him. Are you crazy? No, you don't understand. We had an argument, a disagreement, a misunderstanding maybe, and I don't want to follow him anymore. If you kill me, he'll be happy. Now, God has a conundrum. He can let Jonah drown. Jonah's fault. He's the one that recommended it, right? I mean, if you're going to read from a manual that I didn't write, that's on you. Don't blame Apple if you decided to <laughs> go deep sea diving with your iPhone in your pocket. Don't call them up. They gave you a manual. They told you what depth it can be at before there's problems, right? I just washed my AirPods the other day, and I am hoping that they'll still work. But I can't call up Apple and say, how dare you? They gave me instructions. They've told me, don't wash your AirPods. At this point, Jonah is following a different manual. He's not following God's word. He's not following the teachings, the teachings in the Torah. He's not following anything the other prophets have said before. He's doing his own thing. God could very easily say, that's on you. <laughs> Bro, that's on you. Good luck. But this is where the book of Romans tells us that God works all things out for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. This is where the Bible teaches us that God has a way of turning our mess into something that is malleable, something that can work, something that can, can be productive, something that can actually bring about good. I believe that God in heaven sees Jonah go, uh, throw me overboard, and God is like, uh, O-M-me? 
what, what, what did you just recommend? OM me? Are, are you ser- bro, are you serious? You, you know who I am. You know I'm not like that. Now you're going to make the situation worse. You're going to misrepresent me in front of them just so you can get off the hook. Because of your pride, because of your arrogance, because of your stubbornness, you're going to make me look bad. And let me tell you, there's a lot of believers. We roll like that. We don't care how he looks. Aren't you a Christian? Aren't you a believer? Don't you have an instruction manual that tells you to operate a little bit differently? Jonah's decision from the very beginning keeps getting worse because he never turns back. He never turns away. He's unwilling to repent, so it keeps getting worse. He puts his life in danger. He puts the sailor's life in danger, right? Innocent people. And now he makes God look bad. If I'm God, <laughs> you're going to drown, bruh. But God does something very beautiful. Okay, all right. You can imagine Jesus telling his father, Dad, I, don't, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I have no idea where he got that from. Holy Spirit, hey, 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 hey. I, I never tell people to do stuff like that. That ain't me. What are we going to do? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Listen, listen, listen. All right. He did say that he worshiped us, so um, let's stop the storm. Let's stop the storm, that way they'll know that we are the true God, right? I am the true God. Okay, okay, so we'll stop the storm and they'll have an evangelistic series on the boat, all right? We got it, we got it, okay. And then we gotta gotta get Jonah, we gotta get get Jonah, we gotta get Jonah, hold on, hold on. How am I gonna get Jonah up? Um, Got a fish in the area. All right, Roger, squirrel one. Okay, yep, you need to pick up a package, right? I mean, God is working right now. He's working. All right, okay, we're going to have an evangelistic series. Someone's going to sing special music. We're going to convert this entire ship. And they made vows. They worshiped. They offered praises. They, they came back converted. They got off that cruise. They said, ooh, boy, I tell you, we met somebody. And now Jonah's sinking. So God didn't want Jonah dead because if he wanted Jonah dead, he would have let him drown. But the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that God sends a fish to swallow him up. Many people look at the fish as punishment. I'm telling you right now, the fish was salvation. Do I need to say that again? The fish was salvation. See, in, in, in our mess, in our dysfunction, in our disobedience, God is never working against us. This is the beauty. This is the beauty of the gospel. God it never at any point is working against us. He's always working for us. He's always trying to find a way to make it right. And if we could only understand that, we would realize that repentance is never ever about destroying us. Repentance is always about repairing us. It's about repairing the situation. It's about making things right. And watch what happens. We're we're in Jonah chapter 2. We're about to wrap up. In Jonah chapter 2, watch what happens. From inside the fish, inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. God, that's messed up what you did. Is that what he says? In my distress, I called to the Lord. Oh, oh, now you're calling to him. You weren't calling to him earlier on the boat, but when you're drowning, you're calling, right? In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. Jonah was dead in his trespasses, and yet he could still be heard by God. Somebody say amen on that. Even in full-on rebellion, we can call out to God. In our young adult meeting last night, we were talking, we were talking about the demoniac, and the, the demons had a prayer request that Jesus answered. The demons are like, listen, we know you're the son of God. Listen, listen, just don't send us away from this territory. Just send us into these pigs. And Jesus answered the prayer request of a demon. If Jesus can answer the prayer request of demons, He can answer your prayer request. Come on now. He can answer my prayer request. 
This is just who God is. He's always looking for opportunities to shower us with grace and mercy and repair the relationship and repair the circumstances. And so he's saying, I was, I was, I was in the depths of the dead. I, 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 was, I, was, I was there when I called, in the realm of the dead when I called for help. And you listened to my cry. And then watch this next sentence. You hurled me into the depths. Is that true? Did God hurl Jonah into the depths? That's not truthful. God did not hurl Jonah there. Jonah was hurled into the depths on his recommendation. And the sailors, who were not godly people, did their best not to throw him overboard. Jonah was the one who recommended it. But who did he blame for it? Who did he give responsibility to? This is why I'm telling you when we read, especially the Old Testament, when we read the Old Testament, we have to understand their worldview, their God view. Anything that happens, God is responsible. Anything that goes down, God must have done it. That's why in chapter 1 when we read that God sent the storm, it is very possible God did not send the storm. It's just Jonah's guilty conscience like it's your guilty conscience when you get a flat tire. You're like, oh man, I shouldn't have lied. I shouldn't have lied. I knew it. I knew it. When something goes wrong in your life, you start wondering what you did wrong. That's what Job did. What did I do, Lord? What did I do? Because our view of God is vindictive. He's chasing after us. He's punitive. He wants to hurt us when we disobey. So a storm comes, and Jonah's like, it must be for me. Now, I'm not saying God didn't send it. All I'm saying is that Jonah's worldview is a little bit warped, is it not? You hurled me into the depths. No, he didn't, Jonah. You brought this upon yourself. You're the one that recommended this. You are sinking because of your own stubbornness. The Bible continues on. Into the heart of the very seas and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. That brother went deep. You're out in the middle of the sea and you made it down to the bottom, the floor of the ocean where seaweed is wrapped around your head. You fell. To the roots of the mountains I sank. The earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. Somebody say amen to that. He brings us up from the pit of our mess, our filth. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. And now some might say God might have an attitude and say, oh, now you're going to think of me? Now you're going to remember me? God ain't petty like us. Amen. I remembered you, I remembered you, I remembered you. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Did you hear what he said? Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Don't miss this, right? This is deep. God has love for them. That love is not conditional. That love is for them. And he says that you turn away from God's love when you cling to worthless idols. There are things we are clinging to right now that are placing us outside of God's blessings, placing us outside of, of the impact his love can have on our life right now. This is what Jonah's saying. Now he's starting to get right with his theology here. He's like, he's like we're cling I was clinging to my pride. I was clinging to my arrogance. I was clinging to my own stubbornness, my own way of seeing life. And, and as I was clinging to that, I was pushing myself further and further from your presence. We need to understand something here. Bad things don't happen because God draws near to us. Bad things happen when we pull away. Jonah deciding to run away from God, he was running away from protection. <laughs> you ain't hearing me. Jonah deciding to run away from the presence of God meant he was running away from God's protection. He was running away from his love. He was running away from that bubble. Listen, when the Israelites were in the wilderness and the serpents were attacking them, God didn't send the serpents. Oh, I know what the Bible says. There were always serpents in the wilderness. That's just where serpents hang out. But when they were in 
God's bubble when they weren't running away from his presence, they were protected from the serpents. I mean, even their clothes did not, did, did not wear out. Their sandals, you see, when you're in the presence of God, supernatural things happen. Supernatural things happen. And when you're outside the presence of God, then natural things go down. Jeremiah 34. In Jeremiah 34, God is upset with his people because they are mistreating their servants slash slaves. They are not giving them freedom the way that God ordered them to do so. He says, you cannot have somebody your slave for more than six years. On the seventh year, they must be set free. On the year of Jubilee, all slaves, servants, all debts are canceled out. Ooh, can you imagine that? Uh, can you imagine? We had a year of Jubilee and all our debts were canceled out? Come on, school loans. Come on, school loans. Mortgage. Mortgages are fully paid. With the year of Jubilee, we would be celebrating. So what Israel was doing, they were like, all right, we'll, we'll celebrate the year of Jubilee. Y'all can go free. And then as soon as they let them go free, they recaptured them and say, you're going to be working for another six years. So God is like, okay, <laughs> okay, bet. I declare freedom for you. Freedom to die by the sword. Freedom to die by pestilence. Freedom to die by famine. You want freedom from my laws? I gave you my laws to protect you. I gave you my laws because I was in love with you. I gave you my laws so that you could bless others. But you now want to be abusive? You want to be toxic? Fine. You want freedom from me? I'll bounce. But check this out. When I bounce, you're going to have freedom to die like everybody else. When we choose the presence of God and choose the will of God, we're choosing a supernatural destiny. And when we choose not to follow his plan, we're choosing just a natural way that things go. I don't know about you, but I want something supernatural. I want something that elevates me to a place where I can have greater impact, that I can, I can touch more people for the kingdom of God. That's not arrogance, that's, that's, that's not conceit, that's not self-centeredness. This is truly other-centeredness. The reason why we do what we do in the army of the Lord, the reason why we do what we do in, 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 the, in the class of Jesus Christ, in, in his being one of his pupils, is so that we can impact the kingdom of God, that we can watch it grow, that we do our part. Right? We're not, ma we're not making movies just so our, our name can be in lights. We're making movies so that we can impact others with a message that is inspirational, that elevates people, that teaches them how to see God and to know him. This is why we do what we do. If it's simply about a nicer car or a bigger house or more accolades, we're in it for the wrong reasons. And I'm telling you right now, pride will eventually be our downfall. Worthless idols, worthless idols, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love. Family, do not turn away from him. Return. Repent. He closes out with this, and then we're done. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. Oh, that's a good word. Where does salvation come from? Oh. Seems like Jonah had an evangelistic series as well in the belly of a fish. <laughs> the sailors had one on the boat. Jonah had a believer's evangelistic series in that fish but many of us need those situations can I be honest with you I've had situations like this in the fish and I'm glad God kept me in there a little bit longer sometimes that incubation period needs to be a little bit longer sometimes we need to be reborn again somebody say amen to that we were born again then we got caught up and we need to almost be reborn again I've been there before Running from the Lord. I, listen, I know, listen, I know you're looking at me and say, but, but you're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a pastor, but let me tell you something. I could do this just because it's my job, not because it's my calling. You hear me? 
I can do this just because it's my job and not my calling. There were times I would stand up and preach before people, and my heart was far from God. I was preaching some stuff that I'm like, man, you're lucky it's on paper and I have to say this. Because right now, God, I got words for you. I've been there. I know where Jonah is. You want me to spend my energy and my time dealing with knuckleheads, people who will, who will praise a message one minute and forget it the following week. I'm wasting my time. I want to be a little bit more self-centered. I want to, I, I want to be more insulated. I've been there before. And then I've had my experience three days in the belly of a sea monster. And God kept me there long enough so I could see and really hear. And I could start going back, and some of you could relate to this. I started going back when I was like, man, Lord, I was putting this on you, but this, this was actually my decision, not yours. That was my decision. My bad. You're right. You actually told me this was the right place for me to be, but I rushed getting there. I went outside of your timing. This was the right person, but I, I rushed this and I ignored that. Lord, at every step of the way, I'm always pushing against you. and I, I, You'll point me in a direction. I say, okay, I got it, got it, and I start sprinting. And God is like, no, 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 no. This is a walk. This is a, this is a marathon, bro. Not the 40-yard dash. This is a marathon right now. Walk with me. Yeah, 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 but I'm not, I'll get there. Listen, I'll set it up for you. God, don't worry about it. I already know. I know. I've been where Jonah's been before, and I'm telling you something right now. When we get it wrong, and some of us get it wrong publicly, some of us will get it to the place, to the point of our embarrassment and our shame. I get it. I get it. It's not fair. But when we get it wrong, just turn back. Just turn back. My bad. Just turn back. And you can do that now. But pastor, I've already invested so much time. I know, I know, I know. It's never too late to turn back. But can I just go over to the shore over here, just this one shore? Just like, it's kind of midpoint. Let me just go. This, no, 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 no. Go back. Go back. There's someone here today that needs to repent. You know what you're in right now. You know what you're in right now. You know it. It's not healthy. It's not functional. It's going nowhere. All it does is act like pain medication right now. It helps you for the moment to help you forget what you're struggling with right now, but it's not restoring you. It's not healing you. I'm telling you right now, this is not God's fault. This is your situation. You put yourself here. And there's only one way out. Turn back. If that's where you are today, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. I'm standing right now. I'm already standing. I'm already standing. If that's where you are, I'm asking you to stand to your feet. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Look around. Praise the Lord. People willing to put their pride aside and say, this is me. This is me. This is me. Let's pray, church family. Father God, thank you so much. You're challenging us, you're challenging us, you're challenging us. You've called us to a place of repentance. We're not putting this on you anymore. No more blaming, no more bad theology. Yes, you're chasing after us, but not to stop us against our will, not to force us, not to coerce us, not to chain us to your side. You're chasing after us because you want to find us and restore us. Father, you're not as intimidating as the raging sea that we're on right now. You are that life raft. You are, you are that fish. You want, you want to swallow us up in your love and protect us. So we don't want to run from your presence anymore. We want to run right towards it. It's only in your presence that we will understand. Only in your presence will we'll see. Only in your presence will we'll finally get it right. So we run to you. Those who are standing, repent publicly. Father, may they see the fruits from this change of heart. We will do what we vowed. Like Jonah, we will do what we vowed, and that is follow you, Jesus. Thank you. In your name.